It's been called the other pandemic. While COVID-19 has taken a clear physical toll on tens of millions, it's also exacerbated the mental health issues of tens of millions more. In fact, the CDC study found nearly a quarter of adults reported having a depressive disorder in June of last year, compared to just over 6% in the same time period in 2019. And yet, mental health care too often takes a backseat to physical health concerns. But now lawmakers in Massachusetts are looking to change that. Last week, the state Senate unanimously approved a bill that would guarantee all state residents are eligible for free annual mental health wellness exams, treating them just like our yearly physical exams. It would also create an online portal to smooth the transition from emergency to long-term care, establish a panel to resolve barriers to caring for children with complex behavioral health issues, and dedicate $122 million to recruit and retain nearly 2,000 behavioral professionals. Joining me to talk it through are Massachusetts Senator Julian Sear, Chair of the Joint Committee on Mental Health, Substance Use and Recovery, and the man behind this bill, and Dr. Charmaine Jackman, a psychologist and the founder and CEO of InnoPsych Inc., an organization that aims to end racial disparities in mental health. Thank you both for being here. Good to be with you. Julian, let me start with you. Uh, there are a bunch of provisions in this legislation. We mentioned a few of them. I'd love to get you to talk about a few more. But first, can you explain to people who might not be familiar with the concept uh, what, it, what mental health parity means? Because that is the driving force, as I read it, behind this legislation. What is the idea of mental health parity? Uh, so, so the broader idea here uh, is that mental health care should be treated just like physical health care. And when you look at individual people's experience, when you look at outcomes, when you look at reimbursement rates, when you look, look at uh, inequity measures, right, you continue to see a significant gap uh, in the care that's provided for mental health. Um, and that, that is a gap, even though we've had laws in the books uh, for quite some time around parity. Parity, when you talk about mental health, and insurance parity is related to the process by which uh, insurance benefits are uh, are determined. Um, there continues to be a persistent gap, even though we've had all these laws in the books. But I think more broadly what this bill is about is actually transforming what mental health care and mental health services looks like in Massachusetts. And we're really trying to shed kind of um, older, dated ways of thinking about mental health and make sure that we're positioning mental health uh, so that people can get the care they need when they need it. And so we do that via insurance reforms. We do that through further enforcement of parity, but we also do it by investing in our workforce, uh, opening up access. Uh, and this is something we, we've been keeping at for a long time. So uh, we took up and passed a, actually a version of this bill just before the pandemic in, in February 2020. We're coming back at it now, um, and we're really going to keep at this until we can you know, a, a, achieve a commonwealth where people are able to get the mental health care they need when they need it. You've mentioned some of the details. I want to mention just a couple that caught my eye. Uh, changing the way that inmates in correctional facilities who might be having mental health troubles are treated now, they would be able to get care if this passes and becomes law at a DMH facility as opposed to be staying on mental health watch in the correctional facility where they happen to be. Also, uh, I was interested to see that there was some preventative uh, treatment of or examination of suicide, correct? That, that there would be tracking of suicide data, looking at clusters of attempts, individuals who'd made more than one attempt. Am I getting that right? Yes, and, and we also established a, um, a, a suicide postvention program, uh, actually modeled on some of the, some of the um, uh, unfortunate but really good work that, that was done in places like Nantucket and others where we've seen uh, suicide contagion. So really trying to get at this from a myriad of ways. I want to be really clear that you know, this is part of the Senate's longstanding commitment around transformation of mental health. The Senate President Karen Spoka has made this issue sort of one of, has made this issue one of, you know, her top highest priorities. Uh, and so this is, you know, in part, part of a series of reforms. Uh, if you look no, at what we did around telemedicine access uh, in the Patients First Act, yeah, budget yeah. investments, and we're going to keep at it. Okay. Um, Charmaine Jackson, let me finally get you in here. As a practitioner, when you look at what the Senate is hoping to do here, what looks good to you? And what, if anything, with Julian's proviso that they're not done yet, what, if anything, do you not see here that you think um, should be done sooner rather than later? Thank you. And I just want to, you know, applaud um, Senator Sayre and his colleagues for putting mental health on Front Street. 
Um, we know that mental health is, is a field that has severely been neglected, um, particularly when it comes to children's mental health. So I am a child psychologist um, first and foremost, um, but I'm also a black psychologist. So I bring those lenses into my work and into the founding of InnoPsych. Some of the pieces that I was really excited about um, was one of the prevention measures, which allows for annual mental health checkups for everyone. And this is something that I talk about on my platform, like we all need to really destigmatize mental health. And part of it is making um, practices like that to normalize that. When you go to your pediatrician um, or your PCP every year, going to a therapist or some other professional for a mental health checkup is, is really key. Um, the other part that I was really excited about was the, the focus on um, really supporting emergency services for children and adolescents. So as I worked in schools and, and a high school for the last 17 years and really worked with, with youth who were at acute. And it pained me whenever I would have to send a child to the emergency room because I know they would be there for hours and sometimes not, you know, have to end up boarding on a medical floor and not get access to the services. So I think it's time that we really put some attention to the needs of children and, and adolescents. Um, so I'm really excited about that. And then the third piece um, is around the cultural competence. So um, I think there are two pieces to that. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm a black psychologist and black psychologists make up about 5% of the workforce in the United States. So we're severely underrepresented. And part of that workforce and building, building that pipeline is to normalize a career in the mental health field. I talked to college students and high school students, and they have gotten messages from their family members that one, mental health doesn't exist, right? That's part of the stigma, but also that it's not a viable career, career um, hmm. or, or that they can make money in this field. And so part of the work that I'm doing with colleagues is to really destigmatize and change that message in. One of the other things, I know, I'm, I mean, one no, more. No, no, well, I mean, I, I talked to Julian for like five minutes before asking you to weigh in, so go ahead. <laughs> All right, good. So the other piece is around, um, you know, how do we really, I, I think about it from a legislation perspective, but um, so from, you know, when mental health professionals get licensed, there's no data on their demographics. So what cultural background they come from or even gender. The same um, for insurances, right? When I, when I registered to be an insurance provider, that information isn't, isn't taken. And one of the reasons that I had to start InnoPsych was because people wanted a choice in their provider. They wanted someone who represented their cultural background, who understand the unique things that are culturally or linguistically specific. And so I think that's one thing that I want to see deepen a little bit more because um, what people want more in, in addition to access is a choice in provider. Noted. Um, Let me, now yeah, I'm going to try to <laughs> try to get Go Julian ahead. back okay. in here and course correct <laughs> once again. Um, Julian, since you are, are involved in trying to get this bill into law, I want to ask you about its prospects. Uh, Pass the Senate unanimously. How likely, first off, do you think it is that the House will go for it? And a related question, um, since the House tends to be thought of at least as a little more fiscally moderate or fiscally conservative than the Senate, how expensive would all this be? Which might help answer the first question. So first, I just want to say Dr. Jackman's spot on around the needs for us to look um, very sort of specifically around cultural competency. And there's actually a provision in the Mental Health ABC Act um, around requiring a coordination of uh, basically enhancement around cultural competency, uh, health equity. We know that we get so many better outcomes, particularly in mental health, where you have um, where, where patients are able to connect with their providers, uh, and 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 that's both from a you know race, race ethnicity, sexual orientation. Um, we also know that like language skills are really important. If you need a, a pediatric psychiatrist who has Spanish language skills. Um, Good luck. There's just a handful of them in the state. So Which all makes make sense really because if you're seeing someone about these issues, you're making yourself extremely vulnerable and you want to feel as comfortable as you can, even though it's a very vulnerable situation. Okay, so, so, so we're working on those issues and, and part of the $122 million in loan repayment 
which is going to bring, you know, we think about 2,000 people into this workforce, is to recruit a more diverse workforce. We only have about, we, we estimate that about 90% of the behavioral health workforce in the state is white. Um, that's 90% of the state isn't white, right? We need to make sure that we have culturally competent, accessible providers. I think for the prospects of the bill, um, I actually feel pretty good here, you know, um, yes, we have really prioritized this in the Senate, and that's why thanks to the Senate president's leadership uh, and to the real persistence of a lot of colleagues who've been working on these issues for a number of years. Um, you know, but in the House, we've heard we've I've got great partnership um, with with Adrian Madera, who chairs uh, our committee on the House side. Some strong champions. Um, the speakers said some supportive things, and and the governor as well uh, has made this a top issue. I think we expect the governor. Uh, to put out a bill, I was told in January. So I, I'm feeling actually pretty buoyed. I, I think a lot of what's contained in this bill, you know, this was a unanimous vote. You know, this isn't controversial stuff. In many ways, is there, these are things that are overdue that we haven't done for some yeah. time. Um, so so I, 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 I feel optimistic um, that we can get this done before the end of legislative session All right. uh, in July. We 2022. have to leave it there. I hope when I go back and look at who got to talk how much, I hope it's at least comparable. Uh, but I appreciate okay. both of you. Yeah. Happy Thanksgiving, yeah. you too. Thank you. Yeah. Bye -bye. Thanks, Adam. Take care.